So um, maybe, maybe I'll start. Um, I'm Florence Neal, and uh, you're participating in the first IM Pecha Kucha. Uh, it's the International Mokuhanga Association, um, our new quarterly International Mokuhanga show and tell event. And I want to have a special thank you to fellow organizers, um, April Vollmer and Ralph Kidgel. And um, I'm, you know, I'm looking to see if people are coming in. So um, we have three presenters. Um, Terry McKenna is in Japan, and Patty Hudak is in the US, and Andre Zadarazny. Is in it's Canada. Good. Free pass. It's good. <laughs> um, so we just want to make sure that we keep our mutes on during their presentations. And after each presentation, we'll open up for discussions. And of course, you can enter your comments and, and links in the chat. Um, we're really glad that we can all be together, especially in these days. Um, I'll just say I'm Florence Neal. I'm an artist, IMC board member. I was lucky to attend the first IMC conference in Kyoto in 2011. And in 1990, I co-founded the Kentler International Drawing Space. It's a nonprofit devoted to drawing and works on paper. And we have a Kentler flat files with over 300 artist uh, artworks in there and a real growing focus on Mokuhanga. And we have a website, I'll put it in the chat. This uh, June and July, we're Really, Kentler's really pleased to present a wonderful exhibition continuation of a show that's at Southern Vermont Art Center now, curated by uh, the Mokuhanga sisters and Patty Hudak. And um, yeah, she'll probably tell you more of that. I'd like to introduce Ralph Kitchell. Um, he's gonna talk about our programs and he was vice chair of this last conference and the previous conference in Hawaii and he's gonna stay on with us uh, for two years until the next board takes over planning our IMC conference in, in about three years. Ralph has lived in East Asia for the last 40 years in China, Hong Kong, Japan, and Thailand. He began studying Mokuhanga in Japan in the atelier of Yoshida Kurosaki, oh no, of the Yoshida family in 1990 before continuing as a research student at the Kyoto Seiko under Akira Kurosaki, and then to a master's degree at Tama Art University in T Tokyo. Since leaving Japan, he has been making art, writing, and teaching printmaking, mostly in Thailand, where he's now based. So thank you, Ralph. Where are you? <laughs> Where is Ralph? Well, he said he had a bad internet connection. Oh, Ralph has a bad internet. Are you there, Ralph? I don't see him. He has a bad internet. So, well, we'll just um, move along then. I think what um, I re really wanted to hear from him because he, he did such great work on our um, last conference and what came out of it in the uh, conversations that we had about the presentations and in the breakout sessions, uh, we, we found that we just wanted to keep going. So um, we're gonna do these like quarterly and at different time zones so that uh, Europe can, can be awake and we can be asleep. And um, so I think the next one will be in May and the next one um, probably September. So, and thank you, April, for starting the Google groups, which um, keeps us informed and we'll let you know about that. There's, I'll put it on there. We'd love to hear from you for your presentations. We're gonna try to link them together so that there's some cohesion. Um, but let's just kick it off. I'm, I'm sure that we can hear from Ralph when he gets his um, link back. So first we're gonna hear from Terry McKenna. And uh, Terry was originally trained in oil painting, has a master's degree in fine arts, as well as many years experience tutoring art media to people of all abilities and walks of life in New Zealand, Australia, Japan, and Singapore. Since 
Since 2009, he has been working exclusively in Mokuhanga and has trained for two years in Kyoto under Richard Steiner. Since then, he's established the Australian Mokuhanga School, teach, teaching workshops throughout Australia and New Zealand. Then in 2018, relocated back to Japan where he established the Karuzawa Mokuhanga okay. School. <laughs> People from all over Karu the world. Karuizawa. <laughs> Thank you. Karuizawa. <laughs> Thank you. People from all over the world and within Japan have completed residencies there. And Terry continues to create his own work. In 2021, his work won the Udatsu Washi Award in, at the Summer Mokuhanga Fair in Tokyo. So at this time, I will make uh, Terry a host and he'll be able to share his screen. And Ready to go. Thank you very much, Florence and Ralph and April for organizing this event. It's fantastic to participate. And welcome and hello to various friends and colleagues I can see, some from Australia, some people I haven't met, but I know you by name and perhaps know some of your work. And some people I don't know, and I hope to meet you in the future sometime. I'm sitting outside here in Kaduizo, and you can see the snow. Um, no, it's just a joke, it's a picture. <laughs> but it is quite cold here. Um, we have had a lot of snow this year. Uh, Karuizawa is in uh, central Japan. It's about one hour out of Tokyo. Um, so it's easy to get to, and I hope to see you here sometime. Um, so I'll give a short talk today just about an as aspect of my work um, and show a few examples, particularly about some techniques I use in one particular work. Uh, Florence asked me for a title for this talk, a short title, so I said, oh, water is life. Huh? And I chose that because it comes from a statement I wrote recently about my work. And recent work that I've done has featured water in some way or another in, in different forms, different ways to represent water. But also why I use that is water is a great metaphor for life. Uh, metaphor for emotions, for spirits, for being human, because water is ever changing. It has many states, you know, it's fluid. It also reacts to its surroundings. It's the slightest puff of wind will make waves on water. Um, it's reflective. We, we Sometimes we see not the water itself, but the thing it reflects. Uh, it's also beautiful. And in Mokuhanga, it's essential, of course. All of us who know and make Mokuhanga know how important it is to manage how much water we've got and the problems we have if we have too much or too little. In California. So water is, yeah. <laughs> so water is life, and it's also a huge part of making Mokuhanga. So I've chosen that as a topic. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll uh, switch some. Uh, okay, can you see the slideshow there? Yes. Yep. Yep. Very good. So this this work this is a relatively large work that I um, was lucky to be able to include in a fantastic exhibition on at the moment it's called the World Between the Block and the Paper at the Southern Vermont Art Center. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Mia O, oh, who invited me, and also to Patty Hudak who. I, as far as I know, has been the main organizer for that fantastic exhibition. So thank you to both of you, especially. Um, yeah, so this work is, uh, as I say, relatively large, it's a waterfall. And I chose this to talk about because it's particularly showing a few techniques, uh, gomazuri, tobokashi, and how they can be fitting together to produce different effects and again to show different aspects of water. Um, before I talk about that I'll just skip through a few uh, slides of some other earlier works that show some different approaches to uh, representing water in Mokuhonga. This is an earlier work 
uh, from Ballarat Hake, so that's eight views of Ballarat, and shows a very kind of traditional approach to representing water, which is a wide area in the Bukashi. This is a work called Beyond Raging Waves. It's also in this exhibition at Southern Vermont. And it's a sort of tr transitional work between that traditional approach and a more graphic approach to representing water. And this is a much more graphic approach, just using Bomazuri up here, and not even any very small solid lines, but mostly quite abstract shapes. Um, yeah, so it's becoming stronger in the graphic representation of water. And this is a detail from a, another larger print called Autumn Energy. And it's just using lines. Now, only a crazy person would carve a line block this big. So the, the block's like 90 centimeters tall, 50 centimeters wide for ages. This is a, a very different approach, no lines at all. I call this Quiet Falls. It's a small work, A4 size, and just using Gomazuri and the shape of the block to create different uh, areas of cloud or water. This is a very strong graphic representation of moving water from a recent project I did last year. Um, I just admit somebody. Uh, for a commission that, to produce a number of works. This is from that same series. And here I'm using Mokume, the shape of the wood grain itself to represent water. And back to this work, and I'll skip through a few of the different areas and techniques that I've used. This is Mokume. So I chose the block of wood to do this central waterfall area and to use Mokume to represent the water falling down. This is a kind of classic Gomazuri where you have a light background color as a flat, even color, and then dark Gomazuri, which is small dots here. Goma means sesame seed. So Gomazuri means sesame seed mark. And it's used, um, I say it creates a kind of sense of feeling in work, as opposed to Bokashi, which will create a sense of space. Um, and I use it a lot, it's one of my favorite techniques, it's quite easy. And uh, all you have to do is use no noddy. So noddy helps make the color flat and even. So you take that away, you naturally get a more mottled color then using very light pressure, again, accentuates the small dots. Tobokashi is a technique where instead of cutting, sorry, sorry. So when you've cut your block, you usually have quite a crisp edge. You round off, make a very shallow bevel, round off the edge of the block. You get an effect called tobokashi, means knife bokashi. And that's a very good way to create a soft edge to your uh, color area. This is again Gomazuri, but I'm using a variation of baren pressure. So at the top is just very light and slightly heavier pressure at the bottom to create a denser, darker color. I call this wet Gomazuri. So using a lot more pigment on the block. It takes away the kind of crisp dots that you'd see in this first bit of Gramazuri I showed you and you get a more globby kind of effect. So again, water in Gramazuri is also very uh, varied and creates different effects. This is a combination of Gramazuri and Bokashi. So again, using no nori, but using your approach to Bukashi, where you have pigment at one end, water at the other. And I found this a very nice representation of splashing water. Um, there's a Japanese artist called Chihiro Takisan. She does very nice, large 
Okuhango actually uses uh, this technique to great effect. The other way you get Gomazuri is just not pressing very hard. So even though you have all the, the nori and the setup to make a flat car, just not pressing very hard, easy enough to pressure will give you a model effect. And here we've got Tobokashi and Gomazuri everywhere. Oh, turn off my timer. <laughs> That's my 10 minutes. Oh. <laughs> uh, quickly, this is a, another work using exactly the same blocks and the same techniques in different areas, but different set of colors. So I wanted to make something that was more contemporary, uh, more exciting visually, but color wise. That's the same techniques in the same areas. And that's it. Wow. So thank you very much, everybody. And I look forward to the next presenter, presenters and to discussion coming afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Beautiful. Uh, the next presenter is Patty Hudak. Um, Patty lives in Vermont, where her work embodies philosophy and processes linked to Ireland, China, and Japan. While living in China, her work evolved in, to include theories of ink painting and contains influences by the mystical Irish poet W.B. Yeats. In 2016, 2017, and 2019, Hudak was artist in residence at Mokuhanga Innovation Laboratory at Yama, Yamanashi, Japan, where she studied traditional woodblock printing with Japanese printers and carvers. In addition, she studied privately with master carver Motuharu Asaka and the print artist Katsutoshi Iwasa. She is a recipient of the Vermont Arts Council's 2018-2019 Creation Grant, Vermont Artists to Watch into 20, 2020, and the International Mokuhanga Conference 2021 Awagami Paper Award. So I will make you a co-host here. Mm -hmm. I will unmake you. Let's see. You're the co-host. And I will unmake you. Thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you so much, Florence. OK, let me get this technical stuff done. Yes. Um, I also have to say that my, um, my husband has set me up with a uh, a new microphone, so does it sound good? Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Okay, just want this window. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> so I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight and um, uh, spending time together. Uh, just so delighted to be here. And when Florence and uh, April and Ralph asked if I would um, present, um, I immediately thought of, I really want to present about the Mokohanga community and why it's important. And as I was thinking about it, I, I, I kind of thought, you know, if you talk to people about the Mokohanga community, Everyone says how generous it is, um, how inclusive it is, how welcoming it is. And I am hoping that we can, well, I'm exploring this idea. I don't have the answers, uh, but I am, I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about this in the discussion afterwards. Um, it is generous and it is welcoming. Why? <laughs> <laughs> but it's wonderful. So I'm going to I'm going to explore some of that in my um, in my presentation. Um, I noticed Jane is here, and I think she might be the only one who recognizes these carving uh, blocks. Um, this was carving that I did uh, carving practice that I did with Motoharo Asaka, facilitated by Louise Rouse, who translated for me and invited me into the workshop to meet him and. Um, I was so grateful. Um, 
what are the things that I was thinking about is, okay, so one, one thing that is technically difficult, uh, Mokohanga, there's a lot of mechanical skills, there's um, as we all know, the humidity is really important. The paper is really important. The paper is a whole other can of worms. Um, where do you source your paper? And so the tradition of Mokohanga has always been a relational learning experience. People learn through other people and they learn by relating to other people. So in some way, one way I was starting to frame it is that um, within our community, you're often asking for help or you're given help. And in that sense, I see that as sort of a vertical, I'm gonna mention these again as the presentation goes on, sort of a vertical. So I'm either asking for help or I'm giving help. And um, I, I kind of relate it to when, when I lived in China, um, when you would meet somebody new, um, they were kind of fishing around a little bit for your age. So, you know, they might ask like what your animal year is or whatever, and so I kind of work out, and were they older or younger? And was I their big sister or was I their little sister? And that kind of defined what your relationship to each other was. And so in Mokohanga, I kind of was imagining this, this sort of situation where there are some people who have a little bit more and some people who, who maybe want to know more. And there's a kind of vertical um, relating uh, that goes on. Um, so these were our teachers at um, Mokohanga Innovation Laboratory. We were very blessed to have uh, these individuals um, uh, training us. Not only were they masterful in each area that they uh, of their expertise, but they were also really good artists. And with um, Tetsuo and Toshio Soyama, they had worked with some of the biggest artists in the world. And they had not only technical skills to teach us, but also a lot of wisdom. Um, so we were, we were very, uh, we, when I say we, the Mokohanga community, also Mokohanga sisters. So here we are, uh, Print Collective, Mokohanga sisters, um, which is one kind of community um, where I would say now is more like a horizontal rather, rather than vertical horizontal. It's a peer relationship. And we can come together and ask technical questions or even just support, um, you know, uh, uh, the last few years have been emotional. We meet every two weeks and um, we, we're creating projects together and, and also just there for support. In fact, there was a, a WhatsApp today and Katie was wondering about uh, mounting paper and the others were getting on and it, it's very exciting. This is our first project. Uh, it's a uh, imakamono scroll of um, called Borderless. Um, each one of us, uh, the eight of us have a print in this, um, in this scroll. Um, it's edition of 20. So we each made 20 prints and um, we relied on the skills of Lucy May Schofield to um, to, to bind it together. We, we were taught this at the Mokohanga Innovation Laboratory. We were taught to make, and we all made. Uh, Lucy perfected it uh, to a higher degree. Uh, our intention was that we would all go to Northumberland and work on it together. Um, the pandemic kept us from doing that. Um, so here it is, we, we, the edition of 20. It's been shown, exhibited twice, um, once at the conference in Nara, the Mokohanga conference in Nara, and then once at the Southern Vermont Art Center in Manchester, Vermont. Uh, which brings me to our second project. Um, the Southern Vermont Art Center um, exhibition that is, it is currently on view um, called The World Between the Block and the Paper. 
And um, uh, last summer, uh, Mia O oh had an exhibition of her Mokohanga work at, at the Southern Vermont Art Center. And as I was taking it down, Alison Kreitz is here. Um, she, she's the curator at, and the education director at the Southern Vermont Art Center. I walked into her office and I saw on her wall a Hiroshige print. And uh, I said, Alison, what's, what is that? And she mentioned that they were having a, an exhibition from a local collector of Hiroshige prints in one of the buildings on their campus. Um, and I said, we should do a companion exhibition. And she said to me, can you fill the space? And uh, you can see here, uh, 10 galleries, a library, hallways, two, two staircases. Um, and I said, yes. And I said, yes, knowing <laughs> that we have this network of people. Um, this was kind of a chain reaction. We had the Mokohanga sisters all saying yes. Each sister invited an artist who they regarded either as a teacher, you know, up and down the vertical, a teacher or a student. Uh, so that doubled our number to 16. And then we invited um, artists uh, in the Northeast community, uh, which is where um, Southern Vermont and Art Center serves that community. And, uh, and as well, we invited um, our teachers. So yes, we were able to fill. Uh, it's 170 works on view. Um, so this uh, exhibition is, is based on um, relationships. Um, so I'm going to go through, since um, we really do like to geek out on Mokohanga, I'm going to go through um, uh, and, and, and just give a comparison of, of how these the two artists relate. Um, so Katie Baldwin invites Chihiro Taki, who Terry just mentioned in his presentation. Um, she, she uses the gomazori, uh, which is a technique uh, where you use very little glue uh, rice glue and you uh, use a lot of water. Um, so Katie had uh, mentioned about uh, uh, Taki-san's work that when you look at her work, you can really feel the weather. And she mentioned how it also, and I think common in both of their work is a sense of place, like, a, a, a sense of imagining and putting the viewer into a world. So I invited Louise Rouse, who facilitated my training with Motohara Osaka. Um, we are we're both using um, collage to create patterns. Um, and by creating patterns, we're kind of moving away from our original image and creating another image, also sort of blurring the idea of the sense of space. So you can't really tell. These are actually, Louis's is very small and mine is quite big. And so uh, I kind of enjoy playing with the scale here uh, like that. Kate McDonough invited Katsutoshi Yuasa, um, who she studied with. Uh, and um, uh, along with myself, Kate and Katsu have a great love of Yates, Kate, who was raised in his hometown. Um, within their work, um, you can see a lot of the tooling and the, the hand almost like scratching on the surface of the wood. You can feel that viscerally, uh, that sensation of, of how it feels to have the wood scratched. And they're letting the light come through the line um, kind of creating an optical mix, um, something like a half tone. Mariko invited Hidehiko Goto, who you know as the Baron Maker. And Mariko mentions that uh, Goto san taught her that you can use more than one Baron, even within one work, to create uh, different uh, layered effects uh, within the paper. Their work really has an expression of um, peacefulness and solitude and uh, quiet beauty. And they're both very much um, the white of the paper. Uh, they have these very, both have these very luminous surfaces. 
So Terry McKenna, who we've met, um, Mia invited uh, uh, him to the exhibit. And um, Terry has written um, two remarkable books on Mokohanga. Um, he, he sent them to the Southern Vermont Art Center. Um, and so we have them on view in the library, which I'll show you in a minute. But he's really, really thorough about his process, as you heard in his presentation. Um, he really knows his stuff and he knows how to break it down. So Mia really appreciated that there were times when um, she felt she could contact him and he was very free about giving her advice about printing. Here they're both using ink painting and uh, transferring ink painting onto the block and then carving the block. Uh, but rather than it being a, a kind of an ink line, it's very uh, expressionistic. Uh, use of the ink. So Lucy May Shofiel invites Ayao Shiokawa. Um, Lucy mentions that Ayao is very beautiful, like very ethereal, that her work is like a whisper on the paper. And Ayao uses just enough to get you to see, the, you know, there's there's just such a play between the paper and the ink on the surface of the paper. Um, and uh, Lucy's very, also has a, a sensation that very, they both work in a very dreamy fashion and um, uh, really pushing, uh, Lucy's really pushing the limits of Bokashi here. Um, I've watched her work and, She's tireless to get it right, just get it right. And it becomes a kind of ritual that brings her into kind of, um, I imagine a more altered state. So now we're getting into the next generation. Um, Melissa invited her student, Brendan Riley, to the exhibition. Um, and um, Brendan really admires um, kind of the graphic map um, and playful surfaces uh, um, that Melissa achieves, um, and also her ability to really control the density of the surface. Oops. Oh, I have a waiting room, sorry. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll let them in, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so Yunmi Nam, invited her student, Matthew Willie Garcia. Uh, and um, he's, he's just got his MFA from Kansas uh, University, University of Kansas. And he, he is a really inventive printer. Um, I, I, as I was thinking about their work, uh, Yumi draws upon the past, upon um, even going back to Chinese uh, woodblock printing, um, and um, books such as like the 12 Bamboo Studio where these books were printed to, to teach people how to ink paint. So she is actually, I, I was thinking about, she's going into the past uh, to kind of also find her identity uh, uh, as an Asian artist where Matthew is going into the future and he does very kind of um, uh, space age, almost sci-fi, sci type of work, um, also to explore his identity. Um, so I thought it was kind of interesting how they're going into different directions. And the other thing I think is really interesting about their work is Yunmi's work is really like, as in the old days, woodblock as an imitation of ink painting. And I see Matthew's woodblock really has is almost like silkscreen. So again, it's woodblock, but it's kind of taking a form almost of a different medium. Uh, we've also invited Wood Paper Box, which is another collaboration uh, among three of the Mokohanga sisters uh, that predated Mokohanga sisters. Um, and they do amazing projects together. These are all Mokohanga, three-dimensional and two-dimensional objects. In addition, uh, as I mentioned, we invited uh, a few members of our community, Sarah Holsey and April Volmer, who's on this call as well, 
Um, and I, I noticed the similarities of geometry uh, in their work and also very luminous uh, use of the pigment. Um, and uh, Florence Neal, Annie Bassett, and Jennifer Mac Watkins address contemporary issues with Mokohanga. And I, I'm really interested in these three prints together because it shows the relevance of Mokohanga that that it can be used to address contemporary concerns. Florence is studying um, a water and um, uh, health, not only healthy water, but also water tables. And um, this piece uh, really studies uh, what, what, will, what will the color of water be in the future? So she's using data from people who are answering this question to create her forms. Annie is, um, she did this work um, in response to the last US presidential um, uh, um, uh, election, uh, a previous, uh, uh, and, and, and her own frustration with the choice. And she's, she's using video um, and, and stopping different frames and printing those as separate images to create so it really looks like it's moving fire and represents kind of a angry, the anger that she was feeling at the time. Uh, and Jennifer, uh, um, also she has some beautiful surfaces which, which have a lot of emotion and, and marks. And um, she, she's a, a, a teacher as, as well as a Mokohanga artist. And um, she's, she's really interested in um, school safety um, and she works on other issues, uh, beauty, wi women's power. Um, and um, so our, here's our library um, and we, we invite people to come and, and just spend the day uh, doing research. We have um, Terry's books you can see on the table. Uh, he has these two books here, uh, April Vollmer's book, um, Twila Maya Milanen's uh, book, um, which I think might be out of print. Um, as well as tool catalogs and um, other research materials. So thank you very much for coming tonight and for sharing um, uh, this presentation with me. Um, we have projects coming up. Florence mentioned we are um, doing a project with uh, the Kentler uh, International uh, Drawing Space uh, this summer. Um, we're working on a, another set um, editions uh, that that we hope to have done uh, by August and and then another uh, future exhibition which we'll be announcing soon. So um, thank you very much and um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Patty. So um, our next presentation, I'm going to make you a co-host, Andre, is a uh, Andre Zadorosny is, yeah. <laughs> is a Mokuhanga printmaker and podcaster based in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. He has been working on his print work since 2017 and has produced the unfinished print podcast since 2020. Both of his creative expressions are searching for the meaning of Mokuhanga via discussion and by learning from others. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for having me. Uh, thank you, uh, Ralph Kidgel for asking me. Uh, I feel uh, humbled and uh, a little freaked out because there's so many people that have this long history of stuff and I'm coming late to the game, as they say. Uh, can you see my, my shared my shared screen? Is that, yes. I've never done this before. Yeah, yes. that's good. Okay, fabulous. we see your slides on the left too, but it's it's good. It's all good. Oh, can you see the full? Oh, I do play. There you go. Yeah, that. there you go. Is that, that that's better? Okay, that's it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my name is Andre Zadarosny. I am a woodblock printmaker uh, based in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and uh, I also produce a podcast, as Florence said, called The Unfinished Print. Now, uh, in terms of oh, let me start my thing. In terms of uh, what was I going to talk about? Well, I think the idea, it's called understanding the Mokohanga community, but it's also about understanding myself and where I came. Because I don't have a large body of work. I'm, I've been, I'm super anx anxious about trying to get things done and, and, and trying to be perfect. But you'll kind of see, I have an idea of why that kind of, where that comes from. 
Um, this was this uh, this uh, this was given to me by uh, by Patty. She made this for me. She's like, hey, I got your first. I was freaking out. I was like, okay. So she's like, this is it, the unfinished print. I'm like, awesome. That's me uh, working, uh, doing some radio DJing I do in, here in Toronto sometimes for a hardcore punk show. So uh, the unfinished print. Now, this is the logo. What do you see? Well, you see, you see tools. And I know it's big. Sometimes it's small. But this is the idea. It's a Mokohanga podcast. There's not a lot of stuff. I, I don't see a lot of that going on. There's some print podcasts. But I wanted to fill the void, I think, especially for myself, that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about Mokohanga because I was doing it. I wanted to understand it. And there's just and you hear the the alternatives of kind of like it's it's a small community, but it's actually not. It's a very large community, and it's a fantastic community and very giving. So when you see this logo, you see woodblock tools because without these tools, barren, I could have done pa paper, I could have done anything, pigments. But without those tools, you don't have what you have. You don't have Mokohanga. Okay. Uh, my collection. So when I started getting into uh, Mokohanga and understand, trying to understand it, it was through my collection. This is a small bit of my collection. I, I have a lot of Toyohara Kanichika. I'm a big fan, the big bright colors. Uh, some Shinhanga there, but like, man, if it's Toyohara Kanishika, I am all over it. And as you can see, it's so bright and so powerful. And that's, I start kind of understanding how this is made because you start educating yourself just by collecting. You pick it up, you touch it, you look at it. There's color. How did you do this? What's this look like? This is off registration, that kind of stuff. So in 2014 to 2016, I live in Japan. And this is, I live in Tochigi Prefecture. And this is in Tochigi Prefecture. This is in Otawara. So we start looking at aesthetics. And aesthetics play a big part of kind of my Mokohanga and also the podcast itself. Everything is a woodblock print for me. When I'm in Japan, because I'm, I, I, I'm dedicated kind of to the old ways in my head about the aesthetics of Japan, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. You could be living in Colorado. You could be living in Toronto. You could be living in China. Whatever inspires you. In, in this case, Japan inspires me. So every time I would take pictures or look, I saw it in the prism of Mokohanga. This is where I lived. I lived uh, in uh, behind some rice patties and a really good sushi restaurant, which you can't, which you could see probably in the back. It's a conveyor belt. But I always, I would always take pictures and be like, oh, there's Bokashi. Oh, how do I do that? But I wasn't printing at this time. It was just, it's just become aesthetics and that idea. Same thing here. This is in Tokyo. What is it? It's a dragon, but it's cool. How do I make it? Could I make it? It's all percolating. Uh, I started writing a kabuki blog. So this is in Kyoto. This is the Minamiza. And uh, I, again, coming from a punk rock and a hardcore kind of mentality about DIY and doing it yourself, how, did I, how am I going to be a part of the story? I didn't just want to be a guy that did something. And it's a bit isolating, as we all know. And even when you're living in Japan or you're living anywhere in the world, you, you kind of feel isolated sometimes. So I wanted to... Um, I had interest in Kabuki and, and I wanted to write about it. So I started a Kabuki blog. And again, aesthetics. This is the Minamiza, like I said, in Kyoto. This is the uh, Kabukiza in Tokyo. And I kept taking pictures because I wanted references. I wasn't making anything, but I wanted references. This is a lovely screen. Sometimes it's sponsored by big companies and when you go to the theater. But even if you're just like, oh, look at that. Look at that. There's birds. That's amazing. Let's take a photo of it. There's, you know, chrysanthemum. Look how the, the lights are. It's just constant inspiration and constantly like having a record of things that I may want to do in the future. So when I came back to Toronto in 2016, I joined up with Elizabeth Forrest. Some of you may know her, some of you may not. She's a Mokohanga, she's a Canadian Mokohanga uh, uh, um, artist. She's doing other things now, but this is her print, The Reflective Unconsciousness in 2015. She's a good friend. And I started, I was like, well, now I'm gonna do it, I'm ready. I've percolated, let's go. So I'm gonna do it. So what I did, is this me, I still have that sweater. Uh, it's, uh, it's me doing and starting to learn and getting my hands on it. So like the language of Mokohanga is starting to kind of work its magic. My first print, this is the first print I ever did. Uh, it's dark, which is more to come. This is kind of what was sitting inside of me for as long, I you know. Um, what I didn't say was I had bought David Bowles How to Make a Print in 2007. So from 2007 till about 
this is 2016, that's kind of the percolation of it. I'm, I'm a slow, I'm slow at everything. Um, as a funny aside, every time I speak to, to artists, they always say how first time artists or first time printmakers want to make like fantastic or do you want to try these things? I'm actually doing embossing in, in here. I carved the block to emboss. Like that's insane. I barely know what I'm doing and I'm always trying to do embossing, but you get excited, right? Like you get excited. You're really excited to try this. Paul Benny. Now, I interviewed Paul Binney. Um, this is I took a photo of this in New York, and uh, I guess it was 2017. Uh, I interviewed Paul Binney for my Kabuki uh, blog, which still exists, and uh, he was kind enough. He was doing as at Shulton. This photo was taken, and he invited me to his who his uh, studio in England. So he had done a demonstration uh, at Shulton, and he said, "If you're really serious about this, come along." So again, the Mokahong adventure, like this is. I haven't, I've only just started and I'm opening myself up to different things and experiences. This is in his, this is in, uh, in London. This is where I was working in his studio. Uh, I was carving and it's a Kabuki block. So I'm taking what I've learned, the aesthetic of Kabuki and I wanted to it repre represent it in, in uh, a wood block. And that's my little, I had my little Fudo Mio up there in the corner to kind of watch over me. I had all these little things and it was, it was fantastic. And I had the freedom, I slept on his floor, he gave me some instruction and I was learning. So how do we get to the podcast? So when I was making the, uh, uh, the Kabuki blog, I said, well, I wanna, I wanna share and I wanna explore even more. So that's my good friend, Doug Batchelor. He runs a podcast called What Magic Is This? It's a popular podcast about the occult. And uh, if you're into that, but I watched him do it. Again, there's, I'm timid, you know? I kinda have to push myself. Those are my faults. I see them as false, so I'm slow to the game. And I watched him work, work for a year, and he showed me how to how to do it. So that's my set studio setup. Very simple, very direct. Mac, iPad, coffee, uh, microphone, coffee, and uh, and earphones. So it's pretty simple, and that's kind of where it is. That's that's the studio. So now, what do I learn now? The whole point of this is I, I'm, I'm learning as I go. The Mokahanga the is teaching me from every, even if I don't have to, I haven't carved anything or made anything, I'm learning from collecting, from doing my projects, like working with Elizabeth Forrest, Paul Binney. Now I'm making, and as I'm making, I want to talk to other artists. So I only have a few slides of people, believe me, Terry, I, I've learned from you when I did my interview with you. And so I apologize that you're not up there, but, but there's, I, I can have a list. It would have been a pretty boring list. Like me just talking about what I learned. Cause it's a long list. And it's a lot of good stuff. It's Katsutoshi Yuasa, Mount Fuji in Norway, 2015. Uh, I interviewed him last month. It came out recently and I learned about hard work. And here's a guy that just works and works and works. And I was like, man, that's, that's pretty cool. So I, what am I doing? What can I do? We all work differently. But from Katsu, I was like, yeah, this guy works a lot and he produces a lot and he makes really good work. Walter J. Phillips, April in the Cotswolds, I need this print. This print is like everything he does, he's long dead. But I did, I did an interview with, with someone here in Canada about his work. He's an inspiration. And I, as I read him and I look at him and I see his work, I'm, very, I'm impressed. And it's my goal and my aspiration as a Mokonga printmaker. So what from this, I'm learning tradition. I'm learning how this was made, DIY. He made his own tools, stuff like that, that I can do. It's not esoteric. It's anybody can do this. Patty Hudak, Force of Nature number three. What I learned from Patty, being humble, being like totally wanting and being excited and being like taking it all in. So that, that's just important stuff because, you know, you don't know what you know until you know it kind of thing. Uh, the last few time, last few uh, slides is what I'm learning also is language. So when I'm editing, because Mokohanga for me is not just me making it and the tactility of carving and printing and all that stuff, because you do that, but like editing, this is Carol's, you know, wave files. And I'm learning the language, the actual language, how you guys speak to me, how you talk to me, what you want to talk about, what you don't want to talk about. I mean, it's... It's all there, and I edit it down, but it's like it's a physical manifestation of your voice. So that's it. Uh, that's that's my backyard. Uh, a lot of Bokashi there, a lot, of, a lot of good stuff that I like. 
But uh, if you're interested in what I'm doing, uh, Andres Adorazny Prince, IG, uh, Instagram, and uh, what else? Oh, uh, Spotify. Um, I got a Twitter account, but who cares? Uh, Spotify, uh, Apple Music, and my Libsyn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ralph, would you like to say something? Um, yes. I'm uh, sorry at the beginning, uh, I had a bad signal here. <clears throat> uh, and um, I, I'm just excited that this uh, gathering of people who do Mokohanga has taken place uh, using the Pecha Kucha format, which uh, is also something that began in Japan, I believe. Um, and uh, as uh, Patty and Andre and Terry have all demonstrated, the Mokuhanga community is wide and widening and international. Uh, so it's gone way beyond Japan, which is very exciting. And I think uh, this uh, Pechakucha meeting is a great way for uh, uh, us to come together and see dif different aspects of this community. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure what Florence said at the beginning because I wasn't here, but uh, hopefully we'll meet again every three months. Um, and um, uh, uh, will people have um, questions? Uh, I, I, I'll just kick off the first question. Um, Terry, uh, did you know that Florence also has water as her as a theme in her work? Uh, no. <laughs> Well, plead ignorance. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I don't, I... Yeah. Yeah. Florence, did you see uh -huh. any connections with your work and Terry? Well, it's quite beautiful, actually. I, I, the theme of water, and I, it's on my mind. And actually, Kentler has a, sh a show up now, and one of the pieces called "Water Is Life." <laughs> so. <laughs> um. Oh, Terry, were some of the slides you showed? Um, details? Yes, yeah, some of those were details. In fact, most really only maybe three or four were the whole Oh, image okay, because some of them look of quite the, abstract, but that's because you zoomed in yeah. on the, the detail. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Patty, you should unmute yourself, can you? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I also have a question for Terry. Um, so your water is very Japanese water. You know the shape uh, of what? What do you think of that? And do you draw from Japanese prints or um, decorative objects? Or um, what's your? How did your imagery evolve to look the way it does? Um, well, partly it's consciously created that way to emulate some graphic representations of water that I see in Japanese art. And as Andre pointed out in his talk, everywhere all around you in Japan is really beautiful graphics and images and objects that are so inspiring. Um, there's, and that just filters into you and comes out in your art, whether you like it or not, I think. But partly I drew on that as I also consciously, well, this is a way to create water as a uh, you know, graphic uh, language. So does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful, the, the, those wave patterns. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, water moves and we don't see the line but we do somehow. And Mia, Mia Olson's work, particularly her earlier work with all these beautiful loopy lines was also, I think, influenced me as well. And that work also goes back to quite old Asian ways of you know, representing water particularly. Anyone can Andre. unmute themselves and, and ask a question. Andre. I have a question for Terry. So uh, this is a tech question. When you're carving water, 
when you're trying to understand how to carve water, do you have any advice when you're starting to, I know you can do the Bokashi and you can use the wood, you can use the Mokume, but when you actually mm -hmm. want to carve the depth of water, the action of water, do you have any, do you have any hints or any, anything like that? Uh, well, Richard Steiner, my teacher, always, always said the single most important part of Mokuhanga is the art, making the design. So that's the very first step, you know, to make a design, to make an image, um, and then everything comes from that. So first of all, you make the image of, and the lines and the shapes and, and how you want to represent water or anything, any anything you want to represent. Uh, and from that, then you would choose different techniques that would enhance or go well with you know, what you want to say in the artwork. So that's the approach I would recommend and that's what I use. Yeah. So it all goes back to you, to your design as an artist. And that's why Hokusai is famous. Um, we all know Hokusai's work as Hokusai's work, but he never actually made those prints. Because he worked with you know, mm. Yeah. I had a question for Patty about I mean, everybody seems to work with somebody, um, a master printer, um, and I. Richard Steiner is great. I he bought my first Baren for me. He's so generous. Um, but Patty, you worked with um, I can't pronounce his name with Louis, Louise Rouse. You went to him and worked in Tokyo before you went to Me Lab. Uh. I went to Me Lab first, and um, I studied. I had uh, I studied with basic training with Tula Moilanen. Um, oh, Tula, uh huh. Yeah, and one thing um, I realized after I I took the basic was that I really needed help with carving. Um, and I had uh, I was living in Tokyo at the time, and um, I had met Louise, and she's so impressive uh, as an individual. She, she speaks uh, perfect Japanese and is probably the most integrated that I've seen a foreigner living in Tokyo. She's, she's, Hard to, it'd be and she's yeah, and she's, she's very, um, she's very concerned about uh, craftspeople and Mokohanga craftspeople in, in Japan. And she, so she was studying with Motoharu Asaka, and then she Motohara. facilitated mm -hmm. uh, a lot of workshops. She even brought him to Europe, and um, I think oh, the yes, US. I that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, when I say I studied with Motoharu Asaka, it's not, not like uh, I, I went once a week for maybe six months. So I didn't do an apprenticeship or anything like that. I, yeah, it was it was it was amazing. I have to tell you, um, but um, uh, I I learned so much about carving. Like I can carve with without turning the block now, and I can not perfectly, but I have I can do it, and I can use both sides of the knife. Um, but like I was saying, the, we have the technical skills that we learn, but it's also the relationships. Going to his studio once a week and. Um, oh, fabulous. You know, yeah, the, fabulous. underneath the floor, he he stored old blocks, you know, and then when we would do the make a dam pack and he wanted to weight it, he would take a stack of like these beautiful blocks that he had carved ukiyo-e prints on and that would like weight down the work and just kind of being in, in just a very small space too and um, being among the prints and, and learning some of the culture um, uh, that way, again, through relationships was, it was so and that valuable. was after Tula had introduced you to the basics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then I very much focused on carving and, um, and I still feel like um, it's, it's a lifelong process. I mean, I, I feel like now I'm moving more into the focus on the printing and, and um, I always feel like the printing is so much harder. Yes, I I thought the opposite, it, but now oh. now I really feel what you're I saying always, is absolutely. I still true. rotate the block though. Hmm. 
<laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's, you know, it actually doesn't matter, I think, but, um, but just it's, 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 I know how, like anyway, <laughs> but um, that, that, that practice block you showed in your slides was very impressive. Yeah, uh, well, uh, um, if you took a, a closer look, um, Motohara Osaka had done one of the circles and I had done the other. So where it might look like I improved at the uh, end, he's actually carved the last circle. <laughs> I was actually wondering about Ralph's training too at the Yoshida mm -hmm. studio. That must have been interesting. Um, well, um, yes, it was, uh, but a lot of it was by observation. Um, mm -hmm. I found in Japan that you're not necessarily told directly. Uh, I mean, I imagine with yeah. Patty uh, that um, that uh, with Motoharo. Uh, I what is it, Asaka? Asaka. Asaka, yeah. I imagine with him though, because you're going there specifically to learn carving, um, he would have been quite uh, closely tutoring you or were you left left on your own a lot of the well, time? So the advantage, and this is where Louise came in and Louise had done uh, enough translating. She had studied with him herself um, and then she had done enough translating where I realized she was also translating. Um, she knew me as a as a foreigner and and um, as a Westerner. She knew what why I was there, and she kind of interpreted in in. I, I'm not articulating this, but language, but also she filled in the gaps you know, with those, those kind of things that, um, but, but I was very much guided by him. Um, he sharpened my tools um, and, and, and taught me tool sharpening. He taught me all aspects of, mm. of carving that you could do in, in that amount of time, which, which again is just a, a, a flash in the pan. So I would do the exercises and then carve a, a block of my own drawing and then do exercises. And I did, uh, I ended up carving two blocks while I was there. And the first was in um, Magnolia and the second was a uh, cherry block. So it was, it was amazing experience. Um, yeah. um, uh, I've never, um, I've never carved cherry. Has anybody here uh, today uh, carved, uh, uh, apart from uh, Patty carved uh, in cherry wood? I, oh, yes, I, I have. have. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to build on Patty's experience with Asaka Sensei, because I was lucky enough to get to spend similar amount of time, probably, but maybe maybe more intensively, because I wasn't living there. I was visiting and having three classes a day sometimes. But um, I had no idea what I was getting into. I was laughing at Andres um, calling this the Mokohangu Mokohanga adventure, because I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but I realized that having the opportunity to work with somebody of his skill level was just, you know, would never happen again in my life. But I went in there saying, oh, no, I want to do a, I want to do a cherry block thing. I already had an idea of what I wanted to do. And um, he let me at it, which, um, you know, I mean, it, it was so good of him because it must have broken his heart to see what what a mess I made of it and how many times I broke the blade. Um, but it was it, you know, it helped me develop an affinity with that wood and the and the knife and how to sharpen it and a respect. I mean, you know, I'm still a really clumsy um, worker in that wood. But it's actually. Um, there's many things that you can do with it, as those of you who worked with it know, um, because it's the slightly resinous and, and hard and hard work to cut. Um, and not very forgiving, really, but what, but delightful. And yes, and then Sheena is like working in cheese after that. I mean, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, the, the 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 
maybe the single most beautiful thing that you learn in Japan is uh, incredible respect for the materials. Um, and that historic development with materials uh, is incredible and how it all came, how it all came together. Uh, like I believe that uh, the paper, the washi in Japan was um, that the washi that's used for woodblock printing has been specifically uh, um, fine-tuned over the centuries to be really, really um, um, sympathetic to uh, woodblock printing. I mean, you can see that in uh, all, all your works uh, today. Um, but has, um, has anybody had any success with uh, using other kinds of papers? Um, Outside Japan, that is. Kozo's the best. Hmm. Every time I see a print on on Western paper, oh, the um, uh, in Vermont, I noticed um, what was his name? Patty. Oh, Matt. Matt. Matt Brown. Matt Brown. Yeah, he yeah. prints on inexpensive Western paper. And I look at the prints and I think they just lack some kind of satisfying surface. And it's because they're on uh, Reeves lightweight, not, mm -hmm. not real washy. And it's a subtle thing. I mean, they're beautifully printed, but they don't have that um, surface. What about the Korean Hanji? Oh, that's probably good. I haven't used it. I think Yunmi used it, no? Am I wrong? Oh, you did a portfolio with it, didn't you? I, I've used it once. Um, I mean, I, I use it for other things, but I've only used tried it once from Kuhanga because um, I was invited for to do a portfolio. And part of it was that they invited different artists to use Hanji to do different things. So I, I tried printing Mukuhanga. It prints really beautifully. Um, it, it absorbs really nicely. It was unsized. So I, I think also that's why it kind of absorbed really beautifully. Um, I never got to try more after that, but I think it, it would definitely be worth trying different you know things with it because I can see that it could potentially be really amazing if you add some sizing to the surface because one thing that I noticed is that I don't tend to layer a lot in my print so it worked fine for me um, I do layer to build up I do I do multiple passes sometimes of the same block to build it up a little bit but I don't have a lot of like crazy layering going on in, in my personal print but I did notice like after two or three um, passes, you know, the hair starts to kind of pull off a little bit because it wasn't sized. Um, so From I think, it, yeah, um, and I just print it unsized. I didn't do it. I didn't treat any, I didn't do any treatment to it just to kind of see. Um, the color is really beautiful, but I think it'd be interesting to try, try different things and maybe try sizing it and then printing it. But I, Mia, have you printed on, Mia does a lot of printing on Hanji too. Yeah. I use the many types of the Hanji. And whenever I go back to Korea, I bought um, the different type, different thickness. It's mostly gojo. And sometimes they mix with a little bit of cotton. But still, um, it turns out really well. Of course, it's not sized, so I have to do myself. And I sometimes I, I sometimes bought this uh, Hanji wallpaper. Now it, it it's like a Japan like a they the craft people has a, like really the business is not really going on so they cooperate with other like other ways to make clothes and using as a like using as a fabric and wallpaper. So I was interested to the Hanji, um, the Korean paper, war, Korean wallpaper, and they dyed with certain types of the color. So I got the pink 
and gray. And I printed it because the thickness is just right for the print, uh, the mokohanga. Otherwise, uh, other types of hanji is like really thin. So I tried that one, it's really, really nice. And I really liked it. But um, nowadays I'm using uh, washi mostly since I'm living in Japan. Is hanji less expensive than washi or does uh, it just- um, It depends on who, who make it. Mm -hmm. One time I got it from very uh, well-known really high level of craftsmen. It's, the quality is really good. So the price is the, still expensive. Mm -hmm. But maybe not as well. Um, but Akira Kurosaki took his students to- yeah. Yes. He to used Korea, to- didn't uh, he? he? Yes, he did. Um, and he had a, he ordered specific paper for some of his later work. That's what um, I thought, yeah. Yeah, and he um, used the similar effects as uh, Yumi, uh, where the paper was unsized, but he exploited that. But, um, and any of you here, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but it, I assume that when you print on unsized paper, that the, the actual adding of color kind of sizes the paper. Because I think at a certain point, Kurosaki mm. would be adding layers. Um, and uh, he, um, I, I mean, I haven't looked at them closely for a long time. So I'm not exactly sure how fine his edges were, but he certainly uh, loved, uh, loved to use Korean paper. And he had a specific relationship with a paper mill in Korea. Um, I'd love to find out more about that. Uh, 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 Katsu, oh, sorry. You also, Katsu may know, since he worked with him and did that exhibition. No, I remember hearing about him that um, he used a, a like 10 year old Korean paper, like aged. And I think that when it's old, maybe again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it becomes almost like sized, like there's some kind of- It hardens, um, yeah starch or something that comes out. Elizabeth Forrest did some tests on that with Japanese Paper Place. Do you know about that, Terry? I don't know about that, sorry. She's um, Andre, did some tests on different ages of paper. Andre okay. could talk about that because he had a podcast. Oh, uh, did you interview Elizabeth? Not yet, no. But because we because we we still we see each other, and um, she has a relationship with the Japanese paper place. But um, but the Japanese paper place, the interview I did, she, I was told that certain papers, as they age, that they begin to become, I guess, uh, more fibrous, and they become to kind of come together more the fibers. And I was told that over time, if it's an old paper like Meiji period, Taisho period, later you don't have to size it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so but where are you going to get right. that yeah, yeah I, I just had a couple of things one answer ralph's original question um i've i've used a german paper called zirkel now i, I just put that in the, the chat just a couple of minutes ago that's good i found it's quite smooth uh produces a good result but if you keep with a smaller size a bigger size it tends to not handle the uh, expansion and shrinkage so well. Uh, nothing beats washi, of course, so for beauty and responsiveness. Um, and as Ralph said, it's been developed over the centuries, works beautifully with the technique. Um, and I like his theory because what sizing does is it does fill up the holes. It's in, if you look through, look at washi on a, a magnified, if it's highly magnified, you can see all the fibers crisscrossing and if you had a miniature combi van, you could actually drive right through from one side of the paper to the other. So the sizing does fill up those spaces and reduce bleeding. However, you can actually print quite successfully on unsized paper as well, if you're very careful with the amount of moisture you mm -hmm. use initially in dampening the paper and 
the amount of moisture you have in your pigment. So uh, it's everything's variable and you can get good results with so many different ways. Um, don't be don't be scared of mocha hunger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The other thing that I just wanted to add is um, I've also tried printing on silk, which prints really nicely too. Oh, really? Yeah. But really, really dense, like really tightly woven silk, very fine, very fine silk. And it'll take the watercolor. Yeah, it printed just like paper. I, and I, I dampened it just like paper. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Incredible. Linda, uh, Linda, are you were you just going to uh, say something? Yes, I, I think Patty was asking about the aged paper, and it is true. You know, we're, we're some of the really good paper makers say that if the paper is aged, it can be used well, um, unsized, um, and so a good paper merchant would be able to tell you what papers they have that are aged, like. You know, I can make recommendations. Japanese Paper Place could make recommendations if you want to try unsized paper or select papers that are not sized. Um, Florence's beautiful prints on those long scroll shaped papers, that paper's not sized. Those are absolutely exquisite sheets that are made. And um, it was interesting before about the discussion of good water because water is such an important element to really excellent quality paper the paper making regions that have really good fiber and really good water, of course, have superior paper. Um, another thing you can do if you wanna try unsized paper is you can calendar a little bit before you print on it. You can run it through your press or um, run your bear in over it um, to kind of tighten it up or firm it up, especially, was it you, Yumni, that said about the little hairs coming up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Help a little bit with that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Linda, could you say more about that? You dampen the paper and then run it through a press or what, what is the process? Oh, unmute. That's in my book, Patty. Sorry okay. about that. Um, oh, no. I put book. that in my book, the creative print. I don't think- I'm gonna be at the Southern Vermont Art right. Center this week and I'm gonna go right to that page. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, did you just we mention? Can't hear Linda. We can't hear what Linda's saying. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Um, I don't think you would want to dampen it when you run it through the press because it could uh, uh, change the shape of it a little bit. Mm, yeah. So what I do, Patty, is I have a, a very smooth board uh, that's bigger than the size of the paper your the washi you're doing um, and put the washi face so the smooth printing side face down then have a piece of kitchen paper to protect the paper run ball bearing barren is uh, the tool for this job is to run it heavily over the back of the entire sheet and you, you'll produce a the paper will be compressed and produce a very smooth flat surface on the front mm. and it's particularly good for mokume where you need a smooth paper. Thank you for that. I, I, I love using unsized paper um, but sometimes a little something would be really nice. That that sounds, I'm going to try that. Andre, I'll, I'll change topic if that's okay. I just wanted to say a really big thank you to your podcast is oh. i love listening to all the different stories from people and usually oh. I'm, I'm carving in my studio i find listening to something while i'm carving is quite good and even though i haven't met many of the people you've talked to i feel like i know them really well now yeah um it, it's just sort of feel like it's changed my relationship to other mokohunga practitioners oh so really okay. thank you very much yeah. i well, just thank you to a couple I listened to Kevin Francis yesterday. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that Kevin's was a good one. Andre, yeah. will you put the link in the chat? Because we'll have a copy of the chat. Sure. I think Kevin Francis has a show up now in New yeah, York. Yeah. In New York? Yeah. 
So yeah, you uh, if you go on his Instagram, or uh, you can you can find um, oh Instagram. Yeah, but or I'll send you the link. I I don't have it at the moment. I'm I was planning yeah. to go see on Wednesday. Um, are you going to be in New, yeah, New York, York on Wednesday? Yeah, his prints are beautiful. Pardon? Will you be in New York on Wednesday? Yeah, I'm there now. I'm here now. Oh, <laughs> I'm in California, but I'll be there <laughs> Tuesday night. So we have to get ramen. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. It's our habit. <laughs> and I would like to see Kevin Francis's show. Yeah. He it doesn't, be he's never been to Japan. I should encourage him to visit. Yeah, his stuff is, his stuff's far out. I mean, it's very, I love it. It's just so unique and different. And then, then, then he's got the models. Like it's very, it's very intense sometimes, but it's, um, it's very cool. Very original take on, on uh, Mokohanga. Yeah, Andre, you're really linking us all to each other. Um, well, I, I find I'm I'm really waiting for your podcast to come out. You know, for the next each episode. Oh, that's good. I'm really, that's waiting. good. Yeah, yeah. I got to look at the list. Are you going to do uh, Elizabeth Forrest? I am. We've been playing. She's in Kitchener and uh, outside of Toronto, and she because of COVID. Oh, she and moved stuff, outside she, of Toronto. Pardon me. She she left Toronto. Yeah, she left Toronto, but. I helped her move. She's like three years ago now. Oh, uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Can I? Say, I'll, I'll say though that like when you're making when you're making something that's kind of in unison with it, you're trying to make your print work. There's this like you're learning, but at the same time you're also trying to balance both at the same time. So it's like, which is good, but also uh, interesting. An interesting process because you know you. A lot of my a lot of people just work on one thing and they can really fo focus on it but i but i'm learning so much so it, and i always said that if it's only a group but cam bailey or cam bailey's really nice when i say look cam if you're the oh, only one listening to it one. Mm -hmm. if you're the only one listening to it i'm happy and i really appreciate if artists listen to it and really appreciate it and take it in then that's then my my job is done that's how i see it and if i turn if i can turn pe new people on that's even better too, right? And that's always, that's the new, that's the future, right? You know how to bring in non mokohanga people to understand it, or even other artists from other fields, you know, to appreciate it more. So. Making connections. Um, so we need something uh, to do when we're carving. Um, I just wanted to um, ask people, um, uh, um, way back, through maybe I'm not sure how long it went on for, but there was a Mokuhanga kind of community uh, based um, around something called Baron Forum. Did, did anybody aware of Baron Forum? Yeah, uh, they, he, about David five. Bull was an early networker yeah. who shared information. We're still doing print exchanges. I mean, they happen every couple of months. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, Michelle. So okay. it's it's definitely still happening. Um, oh, okay. Okay. It's, it, you know, it's community-based. So it's basically when someone wants to take in, uh, take control of an idea or a concept, um, they'll kind of post it and take it, take charge of it. But um, uh, it's, it probably happens a couple times a year. Oh, okay. Because I know Barbara used to, uh, Barbara Mason used to uh, kind of um, be the central figure of that. Is she still involved? I haven't seen that name come up. I mean, I'm relatively new she's, to this whole Mokuhanga world, so I haven't seen her name. But it's it's um, it it kind of went dark for a bit, and I think people are trying to like percolate it back up. Well, uh, David <laughs> David focused his energy on this shop he's got in Asakusa. Yeah, David's not really. Um, I don't see him in at all involved. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's it, he's involved with his own uh, his own shop now. Yeah, it's more or less just a bunch of people who want to get together and kind of do print exchanges. So it's, I mean, I've I've participated in a few. It's quite interesting the prints you get from other people. I've experimented and I send horrible prints to other people, and I apologize, but. <laughs> You know, I'm experimenting on stuff. I'm new, um, but it's actually it's quite worthwhile because the the prompts are interesting um, in the sense that they you know they get you to kind of think outside the box or um, 
just be slightly different than what you might be used to. I'm, I'm, I'm new. I'm not an academic. I didn't get a BFA or an MFA and I don't teach. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of learning as I go. So it's, it's been fun. I don't know if how long it, it was, but I think the early bar and forum print exchanges are in the uh, Spencer Museum collection, which yeah. is at the University of Kansas. And I don't know from what year to what year, but it's kind of the earlier years that they started. It was, doing it was a really important connector at the time. It was like before Facebook mm -hmm. in the 90s, maybe. Yeah, I used to. And it was really hard to get information about what was going on in Japan then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the information is still there as far as a resource, but at this point, it's mostly turned into uh, an exchange forum. Yeah, um, there from are, what I can tell. There's so many additional resources available now. Yeah, completely. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane, Jane, um, uh, uh, where are you located? Um, just on mute. Um, I am I'm in Berkeley, California. Oh, Berkeley, right. Yeah. Not far from where I am. I'll have to visit you sometime. Jane, did you was your office did was your office used to be in Nezu in Tokyo? Um nearby, very close by. Um not actually it's Nippori. in Nippori. Um, Nippori. Amoto, oh, no, um, no, no, no. Um, Sando. Amoto Sando. Oh, yeah, I've got the ends mixed up. I'm thinking of um, not Nezu. Uh, um, it was near the Nezu Museum. It, Ayoama? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. I, I think I once uh, dropped in. I don't know really? why. But... How did I not? How was I not there? <laughs> the um, I don't know. It was many, many, many years ago. I don't ago. know. No, um, it's great to see you, Ralph. I, I, um, I came across you very early on in my whole printing pursuit uh, through some early lino prints i think you you did some swimming pools i did and i yes. was um talking of how do you how do you look at water i was looking at prior art and you were one of the sources of prior art so oh. um, i've always been a great admirer of your work from way from you know that was early work i guess for you yeah, yeah, it was back in yeah, it was back in the nineties, which I always think is about five minutes ago, but now yeah. is uh, you know being uh, swallowed up in time. <laughs> yeah. So, do we have topics for the next uh, Pecha, Pecha Kucha? I've heard also Pekachuka. I've heard several different names because I'm an architect, and it's very big in our community. Um, do we have topics for the next one, just out of curiosity? Oh, we don't. We're, um, it would be nice if we could sort of see what people are proposing and put things together. So we don't have a topic in general. Oh, actually, we do. My proposals, right? Mike Lyon is going to be in the next one, and he's talking about technique, his um, major printing technique. And so... Uh, eventually, I think we can put it out there that this is the topic and people can kind of respond to that. But for now, send us your topic. <laughs> Patty? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think, I think that uh, we'd hope to meet uh, again in about three months, uh, maybe the end of May. So yeah. uh, uh, hopefully we'll have, I'm sure we'll have three... Uh, new presentations uh for that and um also we might host it from uh, a european time zone so that we'd get more people from europe it's a bit difficult getting everybody kind of uh able to join at the same time uh is that right florence that's correct yes oh, is that right mara <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I was thinking um, to the to this, three a.m. here, so yeah, completely. <laughs> to the theme, um, well, yeah, the, the, I don't know if it was a stated theme, but this idea about the community, and since it is, it's very meta because this is a community, but um, about that question that Patty raised of why is 
why is the community so generous, inclusive, welcoming? And I, I just was thinking about, um, I mean, I don't have an answer to that question other than it seems so, so very much intrinsic is about exploring and learning and that we learn as social beings a lot. And, and I think that um, dimension you drew about sort of student and teacher, it, it seems like that's actually a reciprocal relationship, isn't it? I, that we learn from teaching and we, we learn from teachers, but we, we um, learn by being student. I mean, we teach, students teach their teachers. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and so these interpersonal connections, to, it, and it seems like we're all learning because we're learning this strange art that isn't, well, it's not, maybe it's a sort of cultural adventure in addition, even for Japanese people, I have to say, because it's, it's so rooted in history. Anyway, I just wanted to share that because I think the social learning aspect is so powerful and mm. drives a lot of the dynamics of this group. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that necessarily comes with Mokohanga because the traditional Hanmoto system wasn't so inclusive and Japanese printers would keep their methods like secret because it's how they earned a living. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I wonder if it's to do with the media. Um, you know, print, like multiple reproductions is much more egalitarian than- Much more to, democratic, say, oil yeah. Painting, yeah. Where you, the yeah. artist produces a single work and every other artist is their competitor. Uh, I just think it's totally different. And it's something I see, say, in Lino Cut community as well. People are much more, um, what was the word you just used? Democratic, well, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a long-term printmaker too, and I find it tends to be that kind of community sharing because we work in print shops together and mm -hmm. share information. But Mokohanga is even more that way. <laughs> Yeah, um, more of a close community. Um, uh, I want to follow up from something Jane said, if I may, um, which is about, um, you know, a teacher can learn from their student. Um, but, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but to some extent in um, Asia, uh, a lineage is more about the student doing exactly what the teacher told them. And I think it would be... Um, how would you say, uh, uh, shocking almost if the student was, if the teacher felt they were learning from the student. I don't know how that sort of lineage happens, but um, I was just reading something about the uh, Buddhism in Thailand where I am and uh, uh, somebody said that um, the language of Buddhism now is um, English. Uh, because um, uh, uh, Buddhism can be taken out of its little small pockets and uh, become more of a kind of world worldwide religion if it's taught in English to some extent, because they were saying, look at the reach of the Dalai Lama, uh, how much he has um, uh, spread the concepts of, of Buddhism uh, through using English. Um, and I think, you know, um, in terms of learning Mokohanga, I think uh, it has its roots in Japan, but it also has a, a wider language. Um, and um, I don't mean that we have to teach in English because it's a, a, a printmaking is, we, we can see printmaking, we can see Mokohanga through the way people work. You don't have to explain it in, in, in English, um, but I, I just wanted to say I think it has a, a, a wider um, now a wider reach than in the past, and um, Jane is absolutely right that we in this kind of network or this community uh, can give to each other, just as Patty said, uh, and uh, give to each other and learn from each other, and I think that's the absolute beauty of this uh, wider community. 
interesting too, because like um, one of the things where when I was working on this presentation, like I got sidetracked a little and had to sort of bring it back. But one of the ideas was about innovation and you don't often think of tradition and innovation in the same kind of category. But if you look at the history of woodblock printing, there is so much innovation, you know, when you look through the different centuries and how when something was introduced, how, how it became sort of like it would shoot through the community, like whether it was a color or a technique. Um, and, and I find that really interesting because I think, um, uh, you know, when I have always thought of things being traditional, I think, oh, they're always looking to the past and they're repeating what's been done. But, um, but yeah, certainly when you look at woodblock printing, it was so innovative. Um, and how did that happen? You know, when you have this hierarchy where of, of teacher, student, how did, how did it even happen? Um, yeah, that's something I think about. Don't you think that's, as an international community, uh, we're not um, the artists who are participating in this international community are more likely to go off in different directions than if we were grown up in a, uh, grew up in a more strictly Japanese approach to printmaking? Yeah, but you see some of the Japanese printmakers even like Chihiro Taki or like when I, I had worked on the CWAJ print show and, and oh, some of the stuff is just, yeah. just mind blowing. Yeah what's being done yep. in Japan in printmaking. It's absolutely because it has this like technical, the technical ability. Facility, then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then just the, mm -hmm. the, the like, yeah, the, the, the awareness of the paper and, yeah, you know, yeah. no matter what kind of printmaking it is. I went to, to the Kawaj show in 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. Just mind blowing what, what's being mm -hmm. done. Yeah. I mean, I recognize I'm a party of one, and so my experience is limited, but I've been uh, learning Japanese brush painting, sumie, for about 20 years. Oh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. part of the process is that you copy your masters, right? You copy the what has been shown mm -hmm. before you. And I've been learning from this teacher for a long time, and I started kind of branching out on my own and showing her very modern works and very abstract works. and she kept on saying back to me, like, well, why can't you go back to the traditional method? Like, why, why, why can't you be what I've been showing you? And so I only, I equate that to Mokohanga where I've not felt like I've had, I can't be abstract and I can, I can do, I mean, all, all the things I've seen uh, in the, uh, the NARA show and, and even today is very modern works and there's no, um, thought process where just because you have this beautiful bounty of historic process that you can't do something non-figurative. You can't, you can, you're allowed to do something abstract. And so there's, ironically, I think something freeing about printmaking, which in a way you're, it's actually, it's much more of a precise process than just kind of paint on paper. Um, and that's what I really appreciate about Mokohanga is that I have not really felt this, um, this, construct of you have to do something you have to it has to be a tree or it has to be like what you've seen before um so maybe there is something kind of inherent about the the community that just allows you to kind of just experiment in your own voice that's more freeing than other types i, I don't know again party of one i have nothing to say but just that and my yeah, friend linda so beeman every single time i show her stuff she's like do it go more, go past, go, go even farther. Like, I mean, she's, she's not holding me back. So it's, it's an amazing community. And that's um, what, that's what I love about it. So. Where are you, Michelle? In so I'm, at, I'm right. I'm outside of Washington, DC. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I still am working. So I'm, I'm relatively new to this. I'm not a, I'm not a full-time artist or uh, an academic. So it's something that I'm doing on my own, but I'm hoping that eventually I kind of move towards doing it more full time. Um, but um, yeah, I'm just a super fan. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, and I, I volunteer for the National Museum of Asian Art, the Freer the Sackler, and I've told everybody about Andre's podcast and all the all the docents and the and the curators are now starting to listen to his work. So oh, good. sorry. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. He's famous in our world. <laughs> That's good. Fabulous museums. It's a fantastic yeah. museum. If anybody's ever in the DC area, um, I'm I will hook you up. I mean, it's just we have a Hiroshige um, exhibit going on right now. I mean, it's oh, just really? we don't have a lot of print which is something that I talk to the assistant curator of Japanese arts often about. So there will actually be a print, a Japanese print room soon at the Sackler. So it's something that I'm, I didn't do anything to get, but I'm still, I'm still happy we're going to have one. So if anybody's in the DC area, I'll, uh, I'll hook you up with a tour. Excellent. Um, um, Michelle, oh, sorry, uh, Michelle, um, I was going to say that, um, uh, the American Library of Congress, is that in Washington? But, um, about 12, 15 years ago, they bought the whole uh, CWAJ exhibition, uh, the College of Women's Association of Japan, Tokyo, uh, with, you oh, know, the yeah. annual, annual it, um, it's an annual printmaking show in Tokyo, uh, which kind of sums up what's going on in printmaking in Japan each year. Well, I, I'm going to say we should close, right, Ralph and April and everyone? Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, we, we got to stop at some point. Yeah, it's, we could go on. It is a great <laughs> pleasure to talk with everybody about these things. It is. Anyway. Right. Well, good night. Continued. Good night. Tomorrow, everybody. Thank you.